Hi everyone, this is Dr. Young. Uh, this is Western Civilization 1. Um, today we're going to turn our attention to uh, the period known as the Early Middle Ages. And let me comment for a minute on the term Middle Ages uh, in the first place. This, this is actually a really uh, misunderstood, even confusing term. Um, uh, the question arises, of course, what, the, the middle of what? What are we in the middle of? Um, did Western civilization or world civilization have a midlife crisis? Well, some, some tend to think that given the term. Um, and who decided, moreover, that this was the middle of something, right? Um, the term originates actually in the 16th century. Uh, scholars during the, the Renaissance period, um, and they actually did use the term Renaissance, which means rebirth, uh, felt that they had, had reinvigorated or, or rediscovered things that had been understood or practiced in antiquity. Um, there was a great resurgence of interest in, in classical things, classical education, the classical tradition. Um, and, uh, you know, these 16th century humanist scholars uh, felt that they had, they had uh, given rebirth, you know, to something that had, had passed out of, out of mind, uh, out of practice. And uh, thus, they labeled the period between classical antiquity and their own period as the Middle Age. And that was an inherently pejorative term um, that, uh, you know, was really kind of smug uh, in its creation um, and didn't take into account the, uh, what the people in that period that they were castigating as middle um, were able to accomplish. Uh, moreover, this really... Uh, sort of indicated, erroneously as it turns out, that uh, there were these sharp breaks between periods, that antiquity had ended very suddenly and thrown the world into chaos, um, and that, uh, you know, that, that chaos had persisted for a thousand years and was only being overcome in the age of the Renaissance when people were rediscovering uh, the, the glories of classical antiquity. Um, and uh, now, historians have, I should say, over the last century or more, uh, overturned these notions of, of sharp breaks, of, of radical disjunctions between historical periods. Hopefully we've already made that clear in our lengthy discussion of late antiquity, um, and that's sort of an outgrowth of this, uh, of this sense of the Middle Ages not being so backward or negative or dark as, uh, you know, as scholars in the Renaissance had, had uh, come to believe. Um, but the term is still with us, and it's still very problematic. Um, you may see this in its adjectival form, which is medieval. Now, make sure you spell that right on papers, because I tend to get a little irked um, when students uh, write medieval, M-I-D uh, hyphen, E-V-I-L, like this is in the middle of something really, really bad, okay? That's not how to spell it. It actually is a derived, it derived from the Latin term uh, medium ivum, which just means middle age. Um, and so it's M-E-D-I-E-V-A-L. Look at your textbook if you need further clarification on that spelling, okay? Um, so the Middle Ages, um, and by the way, English is the only language where that, that uh, term is plural. Um, in every other European language that I know of, at least, um, the term is singular. It's the Middle Age, uh, Moyen Age in French or uh, Mittelalter in German. Um, uh, for some reason in English, we say the Middle Ages. Um, and, but actually, the, the plural is okay because historians have now divided this period up into, into a variety of periods. Um, we're going to look at the early Middle Ages, which runs from around the 7th century until about the turn of the first millennium CE, so about 650 or so uh, to 1,000. Um, and then we will talk uh, at some length about the High Middle Ages, as they're called, um, uh, which run from about 1,000 to about 1,300. Um, if we were to extend this course out, and in fact, if you come, you know, I, I teach... Um, uh, medieval Europe as an upper division class quite frequently, and we extend it out through what's called the late Middle Ages, um, which run from about 1300 to about 1500, and those all sound like nice round numbers um, that mean something. They really don't. Uh, those are just uh, for our convenience, really. We could 
uh, produce um, dates that, that make a lot more sense than that. Um, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, for the purposes of this class, we'll go with the nice round numbers here. Okay. Um, now, you know, we need to get rid of the notion that this period is backward and, and uh, dark and benighted and all of that. Um, this has remained with us. In fact, uh, in addition to the term Middle Ages, we also have the term Dark Ages or the Dark Age. Um, uh, and that term also comes from Renaissance scholars who felt that this period was intellectually backward. Um, that was uh, that uh, sentiment and that term continued through the Enlightenment um, when uh, people, uh, figures, um, and circumstances from the Middle Ages were um, uh, particularly loathed. Um, Edward Gibbon, who, whom I've referred to before in writing his Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, uh, sees the Middle Ages as this, as this terribly backward period, um, superstitious uh, and violent um, because of the fall of Rome, right? The term also gained resonance and, and really um, probably even more resonance as a religious term after the Protestant Reformation, the medieval period was referred to as dark because it was spiritually dark. People, you know, uh, languished in spiritual darkness because of the oppression of the Catholic Church um, and uh, the superstition that went along with that, um, and that that had only been corrected, you know, with the advent of Protestantism. So that's another contributor to the term dark age. Um, and those of you who, you know, are religious who have gone to church may have heard the, the term used in that uh, in that sense, right? Um, I want to completely remove us from the term Dark Ages. There was really nothing dark about this period. Um, uh, even the, um, you know, the only potential validity of that term is that this period is not well known uh, because of the lack of source material, but even that has been corrected, I think, by historians who have worked very hard to um, find sources from the early Middle Ages to bring to light, uh, so to speak, sorry for the continuation of the metaphor there, but uh, to bring to light, you know, what, what happened during this period. Um, and so, you know, please uh, be careful about the term Dark Ages. Uh, I will say that there's a strange... Um, uh, hold that this has still over uh, the art history world. Art historians continue to use the term Dark Ages um, for some reason, uh, but historians don't, don't tend to find a lot of meaning in that. Um, instead, I, I want us to approach this from uh, a number of vantage points. Uh, one of these is to think about cultural legacies. In the early Middle Ages, and we've already seen this to some extent in late antiquity, but that continues and achieves its full realization in the early Middle Ages, we see the coming together of the three great cultural legacies of the ancient world. Um, and I've put up the Latin terms here. They really should be in italics. But um, one of these is Romania, or Roman things, the Greco-Roman legacy, that is. Uh, and this is a literary legacy and a philosophical legacy, um, an artistic legacy. All of those things continue to uh, continued during the early Middle Ages to, to capture the minds of uh, people who were exposed to them. Um, uh, monks in this period, after all, it was primarily monks uh, who uh, continued to do intellectual things like write books and, and maybe more importantly to copy books, uh, to copy manuscripts um, because there was no printing press. Of course, the, you know, books had to be written by hand and these monks were responsible for um, uh, taking books that were in, in uh, ill repair and making copies of them so that they would be preserved. And it, and it was the medieval monks who uh, preserved classical texts like, like Homer and Virgil and Ovid and Seneca and Horace and Hippocrates and Galen and Plato and Aristotle and Cicero and, and all of these uh, you know, um, important authors from antiquity. Um, and so that, that legacy was very much alive in people's minds, and it was also a, a political legacy. The legacy of the, the Roman Empire uh, animated the imaginations of those who worked in the political arena, and we'll talk about that especially when we get to figures like Charlemagne, um, who kind of tower over this whole period politically. The second cultural legacy is the German one, and I've, I've put up the, the, the Latin term here, Germania, right? So the legacy of the Germans. Um, because by the 7th century, um, pretty much all of uh, Western Europe, Latin, Latin Christendom, um, as we might call it, 
uh, although that, that term isn't necessarily applicable um, to the seventh century as we'll, as we'll discuss. Uh, but uh, most of what had been the, the Western Roman Empire, maybe that's a better term, um, was now uh, controlled by German-speaking peoples. The Visigoths in Spain and what used to be Southern Gaul, um, uh, the Franks in um, Northern Gaul extending across what are now the Low Countries and parts of Germany. Um, we also have groups like the Lombards in Northern Italy. Um, the Ostrogoths had been evicted by the Byzantines, but um, you know, there are a few of these Germanic groups um, in control of different parts of, uh, of what used to be the, the Western Roman Empire. Um, and they introduced their own ways of doing things into this mix. Um, uh, the vernacular literatures, uh, the, sorry, the vernacular languages um, that grew up in this period were partially uh, Latin-based. Uh, the languages that evolved into what are now Spanish and uh, Catalan and Italian and French and Portuguese, um, uh, of course, were, were based in Latin. Um, but also the vernacular languages of, uh, of German and Dutch um, and English uh, in, in its form in this period, which was which is called Anglo-Saxon or Old English, were German-based languages, right? Um, and there was, you know, a literature that went along with this um, that we have some spectacular examples of. Uh, and there were, uh, and this is also a political and legal legacy. Uh, many of the uh, legal systems of the German peoples end up um, mixing with the Roman uh, legal systems, and, and uh, you know that the result of that is this amalgamation, right? So the Roman uh, cultural legacy is mixing with the German cultural legacy, and the third of these that, that uh, combines to form European civilization is Christianity, uh, the Christian legacy, right? Um, and that process of amalgamation between those three is underway all through this period. And, and uh, I, mean, I think by about the year 1000, we can say that that has uh, achieved its full synthesis, um, though, of course, it would continue to evolve, as we'll see. Right? And all three of those cultural legacies are important. No, none of them died out. The Greco-Roman legacy did not die out. Uh, there was no sharp break where everything was lost, only to be re rediscovered by the Renaissance. Uh, people during the early Middle Ages and certainly during the high and late Middle Ages uh, appreciated these things every bit as much as, as the, the Renaissance scholars who thought they were doing something new uh, did, right? Um, uh, when in fact they were really just doing things that people had been doing all, over, all, all through this thousand years uh, of the Middle Ages. Another thing that we should discuss is, and, and this is an important um, change in Western Europe, um, and it wasn't something that, you know, happened immediately, necessarily. Um, and it was already underway in late antiquity. Um, but uh, society changed and became more rural than it had been during the Roman period. Uh, Rome ran its empire through its cities, even though probably 90% of the population lived in the rural setting, lived on farms, um, the cities were the most important things politically and administratively and legally. Um, well, with the collapse of the cities, and, and collapse is maybe too strong a term, uh, there were still cities around during the early Middle Ages. In fact, there were cities that, that kind of gained new traction and became uh, important for the first time in this period. Um, but uh, there was, collectively speaking, a, a sure rural, ruralization that was going on in this period. Um, uh, we talked in an earlier lecture about how when the uh, the Vandals took over North Africa, uh, they disrupted the the food supply that uh, you know um, fed the people of the Italian Peninsula and especially the city of Rome, which caused the um, uh, the depopulation of that city uh, and uh, probably lots of other cities as well. Um, and this disruption in the infrastructure meant that uh, those who could afford it uh, tended to, uh, even those who couldn't afford it, I should say, but those who, those who could afford it tended to move out of the cities, out onto um, rural villas. Uh, and those who had wealth and power um, uh, tended to lord it over the people who, who didn't have that. Um, and given that there was a great deal of warfare and violence in this period, people tended to attach themselves to those who could protect them. Uh, and by this we mean, you know, uh, those who 
formerly or in former generations had been Roman officials or those who were warrior chieftains among the German peoples. Um, and uh, thus these uh, strong men, we might call them, ended up exerting outsized influence. And this led to the formation of a kind of nobility in Europe, a rural based nobility who lived on um, and controlled the rural setting through these institutions called manors. Sorry for the ding there, I just got an email, I think. Um, uh, a manor is, and, and this is really generalizing here, uh, manors certainly varied a great deal in their layout and, and uh, purpose across Europe, but man a manor is, uh, generally speaking, a self-contained, mostly self-subsistent rural agricultural unit featuring a, uh, a residence of whoever the key official or the key noble was in that region. Um, and that, that residence might be uh, the residence of a great lord, uh, a king or a duke or a count or something like that. Uh, the residence might be an ecclesiastical institution like a monastery who controlled the surrounding farmland. Um, and so these varied a great deal. Uh, but but that was you know th th that was the person who was in charge or the institution that was in charge, uh, and the majority of the population were peasants, and that term is a very general term. There are lots of uh, distinctions we could draw between different kinds of peasants: people who were free and people who were unfree, people who owned their own land, people who were sharecroppers. So there are lots of different kinds of peasants, but most of the population were peasants, uh, that is, agricultural laborers. Um, who owed usually some sorts of obligations to the nobility. Um, and so a manor would feature, you know, the residence of a noble or a monastery or something, and then all of the peasants who owed obligations, mostly labor obligations, to that lord uh, and supplied uh, all of the, uh, the produce grown on the manor. And the focus very much was on agriculture. Okay. So that's the kind of world that we emerge into in the early Middle Ages. Um, and due to the warfare between different Germanic groups and the, and the, the general instability of much of this period, um, and for reasons that we'll talk about politically, you know, political reasons I should say that we'll talk about it over the course of the next couple of lectures here, um, uh, but there was a great deal of instability. And so you know, the quest for order and the quest for, for safety and stability was key to most of the population, and that lends itself to this type of structure. People found safety on a manor. Uh, even if they had to work hard, they, you know, were supplied with the things that they needed. They were, they were self-sufficient. Um, now, the other major theme, and the one that's going to take up the pretty much the rest of this video, um, is that Europe underwent a conversion to Christianity in this period. Some parts of Europe had already been converted to Christianity, um, and other parts uh, became converted for the first time. Um, this conversion happened through the sponsorship largely of powerful individuals, of kings and of the popes, uh, and of um, uh, clergy uh, who exercised a great deal of influence in this period. Bishops uh, and monasteries, abbots and monasteries, were key to this whole process. But we need to distinguish between two terms here when we're talking about the conversion of Europe. Uh, one term, which we could just call uh, conversion, or we could call um, uh, christening. Uh, that's another term that scholars have used. Um, but I'm going to use the, the term evangelization. Evangelization is the initial phase of um, exposure, usually through the preaching, in fact, invariably through the preaching of uh, clergy, mostly monks, um, who went into areas that were not yet converted to Christianity and preached to them, set up institutions where people could go to, um, uh, to, to, to find Christianity, so to speak. They built churches, they built monasteries, they provided education and schools and things like this. Um, and uh, it's through these institutions and through the efforts of these clergymen that people converted to Christianity from their earlier religious faiths. Uh, in the case of Roman peoples, uh, these would have been the, uh, the, the state cults of Rome and also, you know, the mystery religions that proliferated throughout antiquity that we've, that we've discussed uh, in this class. Um, 
Uh, in the case of the Germanic peoples, this would have been a, a different pantheon of deities, um, uh, those who are recognizable to, to uh, people today, because largely because of the Marvel movies, uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. And so gods like Thor and Odin and Loki and Freya and Sif um, were the Germanic pantheon. And that, that varied um, between different Germanic groups, but uh, the pantheon was, uh, was largely the same, just different uh, methods of worshipping and, and different um, uh, legends, perhaps, that were told among different peoples. Right? And so they convert from the worship of those gods to the worship of Jesus, the Christian god. Um, and, uh, of course, there was a great deal of local variation in that conversion, um, different reasons why different peoples converted and different manners of conversion. Um, that actually makes for a really uh, very dramatic and interesting story. Um, but, uh, but that's the initial phase. Now, there's another term that I'm going to use here, which is Christianization. Christianization is going beyond initial conversion because, you know, when people converted to Christianity, they didn't necessarily do so with a, a great knowledge of the theology or even with the intent to make this the, the, the key cultural factor in their lives. Uh, people continued to, in many cases, to worship their old deities or to fall back on ancestral traditions. Uh, they often conflated um, the worship of Jesus with the worship of their uh, of their ancestral deities, um, you know, so uh, there was a great persistence of, uh, of these sorts of things. Um, uh, the, the culture didn't change much with initial conversion. Christianization, on the other hand, is the process of wholesale cultural change, um, where, you know, the, the, uh, the underlying um, factors in the culture, the basic values, the basic assumptions, even the mythology, changes to become Christian. Um, and uh, that's a process that took a very long time. Centuries, in fact. Um, and we can see it underway in the early Middle Ages, and, and uh, there, you know, very uh, smart scholars have written uh, about this whole process. Um, and, uh, you know, we see the same process, by the way, in the spread of other religions. This isn't just, you know, this isn't just the case for Christianity. We could talk about the Islamization of the Middle East or of parts of Africa or the places where Islam went. Uh, we could talk about the Buddhization of many parts of Asia when Buddhism became the, you know, the, the dominant religion in those regions. Um, it's, you know, the, the process of, of wholesale cultural change is something that does not come immediately and in fact takes many generations to run its full course. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we could ask here is, okay, when do we know that the society has been Christianized? What would be the marks of that? Well, there are a few things that we could identify. Uh, for one, the architectural landscape would change, and I'll discuss this when we get into the High Middle Ages, that by about the year 1000, uh, people could walk across Europe and, and pretty much everywhere they would find churches. Um, and so there'd be some available worship center. It was not necessarily the case before that. People had tended to have to go to the cities uh, to find Christian churches. The, the, the layout, uh, which is still present in Europe today, um, even though many of these churches are not well attended, you go to every little village in Europe, and there is at least one church, and often many churches, um, uh, many of which, maybe most of which, date, um, if not in the building itself, at least in the site, back to the Middle Ages, when those churches were first built. Well, that's something that took, you know, several centuries to complete. By about the year 1000 or so, uh, when a, a monk named Rodolphus Glaber uh, talked about the, the white blanket of churches, which was being laid out across Europe, you know, that, that structure of local churches was pretty much in place. Another um, interesting barometer that we can use to determine the Christianization uh, in the historical sources is names. Um, uh, when people stop naming their children with these ancestral German names like Chlorevech and Merevech, um, and uh, begin to, uh, you really have to hit the, you know, hit those those uh, consonants, those diphthongs hard in the back of the throat. By the way, with some of these Germanic names, um, uh, and, and start naming their children um, uh, Peter and Thomas. Um, and Martin, and pretty much the names of Christian saints, 
uh, in the ancient apostles and, and use biblical names, um, it's pretty certain that an area has been Christianized, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, those are a couple of the, uh, the bits of evidence that we can look at to determine how far along the process of Christianization is in any uh, given historical situation. Now, let's talk about how this happened. Um, by about 600, as you can see from this map, um, most of the Mediterranean, pretty much all of the Mediterranean, had been exposed to Christianity. Um, and, uh, you know, the German peoples who ruled over all of these regions in the West, the Ostrogoths in Italy, um, actually, by this point, the Ostrogoths had been evicted by the Byzantines, but um, the Ostrogoths were Christian. Uh, the Visigoths over here in Spain, the Vandals who had also been evicted by the Byzantines uh, in North Africa, and the, the, the Franks up here, in, uh, in, you know, what is, well, in northern Gaul and in, you know, over here, uh, uh, getting close to the Rhine River. These were all Christian, at least ostensibly Christian. They were converted to Christianity. Interestingly, there's this other part of Europe up here in the British Isles, Ireland, um, which was uh, Christian at this point. Um, through the legendary efforts of St. Patrick, um, Whose story we really don't have time to go into here, but this is a fifth century saint who, uh, interesting story, was was uh, from England, uh, kidnapped uh, uh, by pirates who took him off to Ireland where he became a slave. He later escaped, but then returned to Ireland and uh, through his heroic uh, and miraculous efforts was able to convert the Irish people to Christianity. Uh, it should be said that, and, and then these Irish uh, monks um, then went on, founded missions of their own, and went over here to the British Isles, uh, and to some extent all the way down here to the continent, and began to teach the people who were not yet converted to Christianity. So uh, these Celtic lands were converted, uh, but this was a, the, the Celtic form of Christianity. Now, there are many important uh, differences between that form of Christianity and the one based down here in Rome. Um, and there were some tensions between those two, but they were they were both working for the evangelization and Christianization of other areas. Uh, now, pretty much east of the Rhine River and north of the Danube River, um, the peoples who lived up here, the Germanic-speaking peoples who lived up here, had not yet been converted to Christianity by about 600, um, and that would actually continue. It wasn't until the 8th century, even the 9th century, that... Um, uh, the you know the the incursions of Christianity were made into these regions up here, um, uh, partly through the efforts of Charlemagne, who we'll talk about later. Um, the other place that that was not Christian at this point uh, was Anglo-Saxon England, um, and it should be said that that uh, Roman Britannia had been exposed to Christianity, but then when the Anglo-Saxons crossed uh, the north crossed over the North Sea here and uh, defeated uh, the Romanized Britons and set up these, these kingdoms. Um, there were seven kingdoms in, in Anglo-Saxon England, uh, small kingdoms. Um, they retained their pagan ancestral religion. Um, and, you know, this was the case in the 7th century when Pope Gregory the Great sent a... A uh, group of missionaries, and, and this is a source from a 7th century English uh, clerical writer and later, um, well, I don't think he's ever been canonized as a saint, actually. Um, uh, he's known as, as the Venerable Bede, B-E-D-E. -E. Um, uh, but Bede wrote a history of the English church, as he called it, or rather of the conversion of the Anglo-Saxons and the subsequent events uh, that had to do with Christianity in England. Um, and so he notes here that in the year 582, and, and this is interesting because Bede is writing in England in the seventh, late 7th century. Okay, He's talking about events that occurred about a, a hundred years before he was writing this. Um, and he does so by referring to the fact that there are emperors still being uh, or, or ascending to the throne, right? Maurice, the 54th emperor from Augustus, ascended the throne and reigned 21 years. Maurice was an emperor in Constantinople, and, and all the way in northern England, in the, in the, the, uh, the kingdom of Northumbria, where Bede lived, they knew about Roman emperors. That's, that's how uh, much Rome, the idea of Rome and the Roman Empire, continued to resonate with people even um, this late. 
Now, he, that's just to identify the year. He says, in the tenth year of his reign, Gregory, a man renowned for learning and behavior, was promoted to the Apostolic See of Rome and presided over it 13 years, 6 months, and 10 days. This is Gregory the Great. I talked about him earlier uh, in this class um, and mentioned that he was uh, one of the four great uh, doctors of the Latin Church, uh, a very influential writer, um, uh, scriptural exegete, uh, writer of sermons and other things. Uh, also, um, the Pope who really kind of established uh, the papacy as the central institution in Western Latin Christendom, Western Latin Christianity, I should say. Um, uh, well, this is this is the Gregory that he's talking about here. Okay, um, Gregory was the one who made the decision to send uh, a group of um, missionaries, uh, monks, to Anglo-Saxon England. Uh, this group was headed by a guy named Augustine. This is not to be confused with Augustine of Hippo, one of the other one of the other uh, Latin doctors of the church. This is a different Augustine. Uh, he's known as Augustine of Canterbury, um, but he heads this this group of missionaries who go to Anglo-Saxon England. Um, and it turns out, according to Bede here, that the king of Kent. So this is one of the seven kingdoms. It's the the southeasternmost of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Um, the king of, and it's the first one they went to. Um, the king of Kent had already heard about Christianity because he had made a political alliance via marriage with the Franks. Uh, he had married a Frankish princess named Bertha, and uh, he had taken her as his wife upon condition that she should be permitted to practice her religion with the bishop Ludhard. That's a really great German name, by the way. Ludhard, who was sent with her to preserve the faith. So Bertha, Bertha um, was already a practicing Christian. Um, she, she was so because about a century before this, her ancestor Clovis had converted to Christianity, right? Um, and a century on, you know, the Franks were, were becoming Christianized. Uh, and Bertha uh, had, you know, taken this, this bishop along with her. So, so Ethelbert, who was the king of Kent, uh, had already heard of Christianity, and Berta probably had his ear, and so uh, he permitted the, the monks, led by Augustine, to reside in the city of Canterbury, which was the metropolis of all his dominions, and pursuant of his promise, besides allowing them sustenance, did not refuse them the liberty to preach. And so he gave them the opportunity to preach Christianity um, among his people, right? Now, they didn't go out and, you know, start to, to tell people they were wrong and they needed to repent and convert to Christianity. Instead, they built um, a monastery there, okay? Um, and uh, they preached, yes, but they also built a monastery and offered education to people um, and uh, specifically taught Latin. Um, and even up in Anglo-Saxon England, people understood that learning Latin would uh, be advantageous for them because they could do business on the continent. They could have discourse with people who, uh, who lived in, uh, you know, the, the former Roman lands. Um, Latin was, uh, you know, a valuable skill uh, in this period, right? Um, and so it was through these combined means that uh, Ethelbert of Kent uh, became Christian. He was baptized as a Christian. And as soon as Ethelbert converted, um, because the king sort of determined the religion of his people, he uh, declared that all of his people were Christian. But of course, that didn't mean that they knew about Christianity, that they knew how to practice it, that they uh, knew anything about theology or anything like that, right? This initial phase of conversion probably changed very little apart from the names of their institutions. That is, the, the, you know, they became, or the, the, sort of the uh, distinction that the people were known by. Kent became a Christian kingdom, but the people probably didn't change their behavior at all as a result of that. Now, Gregory understood that this would be the case. And it was Gregory, uh, the Pope, who determined, largely, the strategy for Christianization. Um, Gregory was, was astute and, and really quite um, uh, culturally sensitive here. Um, this is a letter that Gregory wrote to uh, a guy named Miletus, um, an abbot uh, 
who was a kind of go-between between, between uh, you know between Gregory and Augustine, um, and uh, so Gregory in this letter to Miletus writes, "When Almighty God shall bring you to the most reverend Bishop Augustine, um, Augustine became the Bishop of Canterbury, um, and Canterbury became uh, the key site uh, for uh, religious." Um, uh, governance in England, and that's remained the case all the way to the present. The Archbishop of Canterbury is the functional head of the Church of England today, and you know was the most important bishop uh, in England during the Middle Ages, and all of that. Right, that goes all the way back to this sixth century setting. Anyway, when when Almighty God shall bring you to the Most Reverend Bishop Augustine, tell him what I have, after mature deliberation on the affairs of the English, determined upon. So Gregory has been weighing some questions here that Augustine had for him, right? Namely, and here he spells out the answers to, the, to these questions, right, and implicitly the questions themselves, that the temples of the idols in that nation ought not to be destroyed. But let the idols that are in them be destroyed, let holy water be made and sprinkled in the said temples, let altars be erected and relics placed. For if those temples are well built, it is requisite that they, sorry for the typos here, that they be converted from the worship of devils to the service of the true God, that the nation, seeing their temples are not destroyed, may remove error from their hearts, and knowing and adoring the true God, may the more familiarly resort to the places to which they have been accustomed. So what's the, what's the strategy here is the question, right? Well, you can see that Gregory says, we need to keep the institutions that they are already accustomed to in place. If we go in and tear down their temples, and you know we have to ask the temples to what? Well, temples to Germanic gods like Thor and Odin and Loki and these others that we've discussed, right? Um, they are used to going to those places to worship. So if those temples are in good shape, let's just remove all of the symbols of the, these old religions and uh, sprinkle holy water everywhere and put some some relics in there of saints um, and call it a Christian church so that the people will continue to go to the same places they've been accustomed to going. Now Gregory, probably even on his best day, would have to admit that people probably wouldn't change much in what they believed or what they practiced as a result of this, but this was, you know, he was thinking long term here, right? And he continues in the letter to Miletus, because they have been used to slaughter many oxen and the sacrifices to devils, and by devils, of course, he means their pagan gods, some solemnity must be substituted for them on this account, as, for instance, that on the day of the dedication or of the nativities of the holy martyrs whose relics are there deposited, uh, they may build themselves huts to the boughs of trees about those churches which have been turned to that use from temples and celebrate the solemnity with religious feasting, no more offering beasts to the devil, but killing cattle to the praise of God and their eating. And, you know, then he says they, you know, when the, if these outward things are given to them, then they might begin to feel something for Christianity internally. Okay. So, in other words, keep their practices in place. Don't just keep their temples in place, but keep their practices in place. Uh, if they're used to having big feasts as part of their religious festivals, well, let them continue to do that just maybe change the dates or set up new festivals for them, the festival of the dedication of the church or the festival of the um, uh, the saints' days of the, the relics that are placed in those churches or whatever it is. Let's come up with some occasions for them to continue to worship and let them continue to worship in the way that they were accustomed to do so, right? Now, the result of this is that the Germanic religious practices become amalgamated with Christian religious practices. And this can be, this gets even more complicated because the Christianity that exists in, in the, the Celtic world, the Irish world, is different from the Roman Christianity. And so there's even some mixing of these different kinds of Christianity now in this Germanic setting uh, where, you know, these... Um, uh, the Germanic practices persist, and the result is that the the form of Christianity, the the uh, practices, the rituals of Christianity become uh, well, they, they're they're like a hybrid, uh, a mongrel, one might even say, right? Uh, let me give you a couple examples here, okay? So, uh, 
Um, in ancient times, uh, people tended to worship the sun. There, are, there's you know there are sun deities in the Greco-Roman pantheons. Apollo uh, being the pr most prominent of them, and there are you know there's the worship of the sun featured in the Germanic pantheon as well. Um, and so one of the great festivals in worship of the sun was was performed at the winter solstice. Why the winter solstice? You might ask. Well. Uh, it's a symbolic thing. Uh, the winter solstice is the, the time when the darkness is greatest, but, but um, with the solstice, light begins to come back into the world. The sun becomes more apparent. Every day there are a few more minutes of sunlight, right, leading up to summer when sun uh, is at its greatest power. Okay, um, And so the solstice was this, this potent time of year to venerate the sun god. Okay. Now, in trying to um, come up with different festivals in Christianity, ancient peoples uh, began to held, hold celebrations commemorating the birth of Jesus. They didn't know when he was born. There was no record of the time of year or anything like that when he was born. Thus, they chose a symbolic time, which was around the winter solstice. Why? Well, Jesus is described as the light of the world. He's... Uh, and in some cases, even in, in antiquity, he was conflated with the sun god. Uh, this may have been the case for Constantine, for instance. Um, and so uh, it made sense to, to you know, venerate uh, or to celebrate the, the birth of Jesus around the time of the winter solstice. He, the light is coming into the world with the birth of Jesus, after all, right? Um, and so the festival, the very important Christian festival of Christmas was held around the winter solstice. And as these uh, 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 Greco-Roman traditions and Germanic traditions of solstice uh, began to merge with Christianity, um, the practice of Christmas, the worship of Christmas, uh, also uh, amalgamated with those traditions. And, and many of the, um, uh, the symbols and traditions of uh, uh, of the Christian Christmas come from these pagan origins. What you might ask? Well, evergreen imagery, not the Christmas tree per se, that's a later development, but things like holly and ivy and mistletoe um, were part of solstice. Uh, the burning of a massive log, which was known as the Yule, uh, was also done at solstice, and, and the term Yule and the Yule log and these things uh, become part of the, the practice of Christmas. Um, and, you know, there are several other things. Uh, the, the practice of, of drinking special drinks and eating special foods um, were part of solstice. Uh, wassail is a term that was you know, part of Germanic solstice. And you know, there's some other things, right, uh, that we would recognize as, as part of traditional Christmas, which actually have these pagan origins. An even better example, probably, uh, is in the, um, uh, the festival of the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus, Easter, Easter, in fact, is uh, derived from the Greek, or sorry, the Germanic goddess of fertility, Aostra. Um, it was there was a fertility festival held in the spring, um, and the, the some of the practices and some of the symbols of that fertility festival end up in the uh, the, the practice uh, or the celebration of Easter. Uh, symbols like eggs, in particular, not rabbits, although those are fitting fertility symbols too, uh, but. Um, uh, rabbits are, are a later development, um, specifically the peasants in the Middle Ages were required to make a meat offering to their lords uh, during Easter, and the most readily available source of meat were wild rabbits, and so the rabbit ended up on the lord's dinner table during Easter, uh, a far cry from the, the nice little bunny who delivers some um, chocolate and things like that to good children on Easter. Uh, today, um, Easter bunny had uh, more grim origin, shall we say. Uh, but eggs, um, and uh, that particularly as a fertility symbol, came from these pagan origins. Even cultural features like the names of days um, are part of this amalgamation of German and Roman and Christian things. Um, you know, uh, Saturday is Saturn's day, right? Saturn uh, being the uh, uh, one of the uh, Greco-Roman gods. Um, uh, Roman God specifically, right? Um, Sunday after the, the sun. Um, uh, two, uh, sorry, Wednesday after Odin, Woden's day, right? Uh, Thursday after Thor, Friday after Freya. Um, 
And so, you know, those are some examples here. And that's not in every language, by the way. Um, the names of these days are uh, are different in, in some languages. There is no Woden's Day in German, curiously. It's called Mitvok or Midweek. Um, but, uh, you know, there is a uh, uh, there is a uh, Freitag after Freya um, uh, in German. Um, so, you know, th this, this combining of these different cultures is, um, again, one of the key themes that we see here. Now, we'll continue to explore this and look at some other things next time as we get into the political history of the early Middle Ages um, and talk especially about the, the most important of the Germanic kingdoms, the Frankish kingdom, uh, and, uh, you know, get into figures like Charlemagne. So um, I will see you in the next lecture.